one. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Vasilis Kuchuridis, and I am part of the faculty of the, uh, the of the School of the Computer Science in our university. Uh, the title of my talk today is about eye movement models as a gateway to brain disorders and what goes wrong there. And uh, I was uh, recently published a, a book on uh, this um, uh, stuff that I'm going to talk about uh, today, uh, and it was published by Springer, and the title of the book was Multiscape Models of Brain Disorders. So one slide about who I am, just in case you don't know me, which is very uh, probable. So I'm a computational neuroscientist and a cognitive modeler, uh, broadly interested to reverse engineer how the brain and mind works in uh, health and, and in disease in order to understand how faculties such as learning and memory or attention or visual perception uh, give rise from the complex organ uh, of uh, the brain. And by doing that, I'm planning to also extract the algorithms or blueprint designs and architectures uh, in order to design, develop more efficient and more intelligent methods and uh, systems. So my research uh, so far has uh, focused on developing uh, theories, ideas, and conceptual frameworks. Uh, Multiscale models, uh, meaning models that bridge gaps between different uh, levels of complexity, starting from, let's say, the cellular, going to the network, going to the circuit, going to the systems, all the way to the behavior uh, of uh, the uh, nervous system. And then using this type of information that I learn uh, and we learn in the lab to uh, be able to design intelligent methods for complex data analysis or intelligent systems with autonomous and creative behavior. So that's, uh, that's me. Uh, without uh, any more delay, I would like to jump directly into the, uh, the talk for today. So the agenda is um, I'm going to give you uh, one or two slides of what eye movements are, uh, why they're there, how they're generated, and what are the types of those eye movements. And then I'm going to jump into one specific type of those eye movements, which are called uh, saccadic eye movements or saccades. And then I'm going to talk about the metrics, the different types of saccades, the circuits that support uh, the generation of saccades, and the different disorders that are directly involved with these saccadic eye movements. Then I'll jump into uh, response inhibition or impulse control and what breaks down in brain disorders, in particular to um, a saccadic eye movement task, which is known as uh, anti saccade and I'm going into details what uh, this actually, uh, what this tax is all about. And at the very end, since I'm a computational scientist, I'm just going to present a computational model, computational models of uh, performance of uh, human participants uh, in the anti saccade task in various uh, brain disorders. But because of the time limitations, I'm only going to talk about the schizophrenia uh, patients. So. Uh, let's start. So eye movements, we know, we understand what they are. They are the movements of the eye. There are five types. Uh, uh, two of them are about uh, holding the eyes in a fixed uh, location in space, gaze, uh, holding the gaze fixed. And this is the vestibular ocular reflex or the optokinetic uh, reflex. There are two different uh, uh, eye movements. And then there are three other types of uh, movements which are heavily related with gaze shifting. And one is the saccades, the other one is the smooth pursuit, and the third one is the virgins. So today I'm only gonna talk about uh, saccades, not because all the other movements are not uh, equally important, uh, but because my research is more, um, has been targeting the saccades for a number of years now. So what does, each of those eye movements um, have, they serve a particular unique function that can bring, for instance, the eye towards a particular uh, uh, aspect of the visual scene, and that's uh, they allow the perception to take place. And uh, they have, uh, in order to be able to support this function, they have specific uh, and unique properties and uh, particular circuits in the brain that support uh, this type of um, eye movements. So the next slide, it's about saccades. So what, what are those uh, saccades? So they're eye movements which are extremely fast. They're ballistic, meaning that they open loop. So once you generate a saccade, you cannot correct the saccade while it is en route to the target. Uh, and they're heavily related with visual perception. Uh, and what they do is they change the point of fixation 
in order to aid visual recognition and scene understanding. So we can see here from uh, this uh, image right here uh, that uh, uh, there are um, five different uh, fixation points, which are the red uh, circles, and then lines that correct those uh, uh, red circles. Uh, and those lines are actually the saccades. So the, the, the red uh, circles are the fixation points, the fixations, and uh, the lines are the saccades that drive the eye from one fixation point uh, to the next. The order by which the fixations and the saccades are taking place are extremely important in understanding uh, that what we see here is a bird and uh, not uh, a dog. Now, here, for instance, we can see that we use saccades when we're reading a text. Uh, we can see that our eyes are fixating at different words uh, of this uh, particular text. And here we see the lines that correct, uh, that connect those uh, uh, fixation points. And those are the uh, saccades. So now, saccadic eye movements uh, and how we record them is uh, we use uh, a very um, elaborate uh, and uh, complicated uh, experimental setup which involves uh, usually um, a laptop or a computer. Uh, a subject is seated in front of a, a desk uh, where the laptop is um, situated. Uh, different stimuli are presented on the screen. And then a headset um, with um, uh, cameras that record how the eyes move with respect to this um, image that uh, the, uh, the participant is viewing. Uh, then we can see where the eyes land, where they fixate, and where they uh, saccade, and the order of those uh, fixations and uh, saccades. So the very first uh, study of uh, saccades was done um, in 1967 by this Russian scientist, which showed that when uh, he presented different uh, art um, images, you know, famous paintings to uh, subjects, uh, to participants, he found that the order of the eye movements, the fixations and the saccades, were heavily influenced by the particular task um, that the participants were um, um, contributing. So they can see, uh, for, for instance, in free examination of this particular image, uh, a completely different um, uh, scan path, a sequence of fixations and uh, saccades were generated compared to uh, remembering the task of remembering the clothes that the people were wearing. Now, um, since uh, 1967, there was a few years later, there was um, a, a study by another group which showed that if you train participants long enough uh, with uh, uh, viewing particular images, then the scan paths that they follow, the, those, the sequence of uh, fixations and uh, uh, saccades, tends to repeat, uh, tend to repeat uh, themselves from trial to trial. And that generated uh, something called the scan path theory, uh, 1971. Uh, and a lot of research has been uh, uh, done since then, trying to decipher what are the uh, mechanisms within the brain that can support this type of uh, a theory. Now, so saccades is something that we all do uh, every, in everyday uh, life. Uh, we usually generate saccades, uh, about 150,000 of them per day, and roughly three saccades per, uh, per second. And saccades are heavily related to visual perception. Without shifting the eyes between different fixation points, then we won't be able to understand what surrounds us. Now, Saccades also have certain uh, properties. As I said uh, before, they're extremely fast, uh, roughly to 900 uh, degrees per second. Uh, they're ballistic, uh, the open loop, meaning there is no chance for a, correct, a correction during uh, the execution of a particular saccade. The different types of saccades, there, so they are horizontal saccades, the vertical saccades, the oblique saccades, uh, and they can be both uh, involuntary uh, or reflexively uh, generated, such as uh, rapid eye movements during sleep, or they can be voluntarily generated, executed, uh, such as reading a particular text. 
Now, there are different characteristics of saccades, different metrics. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, there is uh, the amplitude, how much, um, uh, how many degrees did the eye move from the starting position all the way to the end position over here? So the difference between uh, this point and that point is the saccade amplitude. Uh, something about the gain, the duration, how long did it take for the eye movement to start to, uh, from the starting position all the way to the end position? Uh, the velocity, uh, so they have saccades, they have a very specific and um, universal velocity profile, which uh, tends to be very symmetric about its uh, peak. Uh, and it has uh, what, it, what we know as a bell-shaped uh, curve. Um, the peak velocity and the latency, which uh, um, refers to how much time, how much cognitive time did it take for the brain to uh, generate a motor command that it was sent to the eyes in order for the eyes uh, to move. So the latency refers to something called saca reaction time, and it's very important in the talk that uh, um, that uh, I'm going to go through today. Now saccades are, as I said, they're um, generated either um, uh, exogenously, uh, meaning that there is uh, a visual stimulus that can drive a saccade. Uh, and uh, under this category, we have something called pro saccades or express saccades. And the difference between them is how long the duration and the latency for generating uh, those saccades. And then there are other saccades which are generated because of uh, intention or free will or because of volition. And uh, those are the memory guided saccades, anti saccades, predictive saccades, and a memory sequence. And a last um, subtype of a saccade is something called a micro saccade. So when we are fixating on a particular uh, um, um, spot in the visual scene, our eyes are not really uh, uh, um, uh, fixed, uh, meaning that they move around, they have a small jitter around that uh, particular spot over there. And they do that because if the eyes are fixated, Therefore, they don't have those micro saccades, then visual perception uh, fades away. All right, so this talk is about the anti saccades. Uh, let's see a little bit how saccades are generated. All right, so to generate saccade, obviously, you need the organ that will generate the saccade, and that's the eye, right? So the light impinges on the cornea then is uh, transmitted back into a very specialized um, uh, region of uh, at the back of the eye, which is called the retina. It has a very specialized uh, circuitry, which uh, transforms the light uh, pulses into neural impulses, spikes, which then are, are propagated down the optic nerve to um, uh, lower uh, brain regions or higher uh, brain regions. Now, the eyes are, in order to be able to move, they have muscles. And as a matter of fact, there are six different types of muscles. And depending which muscle uh, moves, then we generate all these different patterns of uh, eye movements, right? Uh, so as we said, uh, eyes can move either in the horizontal way, or they can move in the vertical way, or they can move uh, in, uh, in the oblique way, in the uh, diagonal way. Um, in addition to uh, the muscles themselves, they're also connected with um, cranial nerves, uh, which uh, then form um, um, send signals to different parts of the brain, particularly in the midbrain, uh, that control how the eyes will move. So uh, muscles and then the cranial nerves and the different subcortical regions are heavily related with the motor control of uh, the eye movement. However, the eye itself, it's not just about uh, moving, but also contributes to visual perception. So there are other brain regions uh, that rely on, um, on in, in the higher uh, brain uh, centers uh, that receive the information from the eye, uh, process the information at the back of the, the eye in the occipital lobe over here, uh, they, then, then they decompose the information into uh, the identity of what you see, the identity of the object that goes into the ventral part, and then where the object is in space, uh, uh, the where part, that follows this um, upward kind of uh, pathway over here. 
And we can see that the, the, there is a division of labor in the brain where different brain areas are given specific, uh, uh, the support for specific functions. So we can see that areas that uh, decompose the visual information, other areas that integrate visual information and spatial information, other areas that have to do with uh, visual spatial attention, uh, motivation, fixation, uh, saccad triggering, model programs, uh, motor learning, uh, decision making, and execution, and obviously about uh, memory. So aside from, uh, because we're talking about the brain and uh, it's either the human brain or the, um, the animal brain, uh, there are certain um, uh, disorders that, uh, uh, that follow those, uh, the, the brain. And uh, the, these disorders fall under two categories, uh, the movement disorders and the non-movement disorders or neuropsychiatric disorders or cognitive uh, disorders. So under the movement disorders of uh, the uh, saccades, we have Parkinson's disease and we have Huntington disease, or we have uh, spinal cerebellar attack, uh, ataxia or oculomotor ataxia and many, many others. Now, under the category of neuropsychiatric uh, disorders, we have uh, schizophrenia, uh, autism, uh, Alzheimer's disease related to memory or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and many others. So the talk today is about uh, the schizophrenia. Not uh, because uh, uh, there is no research done along all the other diseases, uh, largely because of the uh, time limitations that uh, exist with this uh, talk. All right, so uh, what we know about schizophrenia uh, is that uh, they have um, the, the schizophrenia suffering uh, patients uh, they uh, suffer from um, inability to control their impulses, failure uh, to resist to a temptation, to an urge, to an impulse, or the inability not to speak or act on a particular thought. Um, so if you are in a particular uh, situation where you are face to face with uh, uh, something that uh, potentially might um, um, uh, cost your life, like you're facing a lion, there are different decisions that you can um, uh, uh, make at that uh, time. One decision is you can start running. Uh, the other decision is you can st stand still and do nothing. Hopefully the, the lion will pass you by. Or the other one is you can attack the, the animal or other type of uh, decisions. So some of those decisions can be uh, very detrimental to your health and other decisions uh, can be very beneficial. So people that uh, are uh, characterized by this failure to resist uh, uh, a temptation or they have this uh, inability to control the impulses, they usually make a lot of uh, mistakes, a lot of errors that tend to be uh, detrimental to uh, their health. So in the lab now, what uh, people usually do is uh, they oversimplify this. So we cannot introduce a lion in the lab, obviously, uh, but what you can do is you can set up um, uh, a psychological experiment and that will involve eye, eye movements. And you wanna study how um, participants, usually human participants, uh, can um, control their impulses. So one of those uh, tasks is something called the anti saccade task, right? So in this anti saccade task, um, uh, participants are sitting in front of a computer screen. They're asked to fixate on a central stimulus. And uh, as soon as the central stimulus um, disappears, uh, they have to turn the eyes in the opposite direction of the uh, peripheral one. So in this particular task, the uh, subjects are requested uh, not to, uh, to suppress the reflexive uh, eye movement, the one uh, not making eye movement towards the stimulus that captures your attention, but instead uh, voluntarily shift your eyes in the opposite uh, direction. So here in this particular task, the, every participant is faced with two decisions. One decision is to make uh, an error reflexive eye movement towards the, uh, the stimulus or make a correct anti-saccade 
in the opposite direction of the peripheral stimulus. So when uh, participants and uh, scientists are uh, uh, measuring the behavior or the performance of task during uh, uh, the performance of uh, participants doing this task, what they measure is something called the error rate. How many of those error eye movements are, uh, uh, are happening? Uh, the mean or median latency, how much cognitive uh, time, uh, information processing time, does it take a participant to generate an eye movement? Uh, whether this latency is variable from uh, trial to trial? Uh, when you take all these uh, latencies and you plot a distribution, what is the shape of that uh, distribution? What is the amplitude of either the error saccade or the correct anti-saccad? If there are any accuracy constraints and many other uh, parameters that are usually measured. Now, in neuropsychiatric uh, disorders, uh, such as schizophrenia, uh, the, um, the, uh, the metric that actually tells uh, clinicians, uh, psychiatrists or neurologists, that there, there might be a, a problem with this uh, participant is the error rate. Because you, these uh, patients usually have an error rate of roughly 70% uh, errors or 80% errors, as if those participants are not really getting the uh, uh, the instructions that they receive uh, from the uh, scientists. Now, during this anti task, uh, what um, uh, uh, scientists observe is that the participants generate three uh, uh, response types. So a participant in a single trial can either generate um, an, a reflexive eye movement, the error pro saccade towards the, the stimulus, or in another trial can generate the correct anti saccade, moving the eyes in the opposite direction, or during a, another trial, they do an error pro saccade followed by a corrected anti saccade. And those Aeroprosacat, antisacat, and corrected antisacats are three different eye movements generated by different mechanisms in the uh, in the brain, and that is a fact largely because when they uh, measure them in a very big data um, uh, study from 2075 uh, controls. Uh, performing this anti saccade task, they found that actually the latency required to produce an anti saccade was 270 milliseconds, where the latency for the error pro was 210 milliseconds, and the latency for the corrected anti saccades was, uh, uh, anti was 146 milliseconds. So clearly, different uh, brain pathways are being utilized to uh, result in these different uh, latency um, uh, parameters. OK. All right, so, um, so how do we uh, um, model uh, um, uh, decision making? So if we are in the, the situation where you have uh, a single stimulus that is uh, presented to you, uh, and you're sitting in front of a computer screen and you have to make a decision. Uh, scientists, what uh, they did is the uh, picture, at least con conceptually, that decision making, it's a, it's a race uh, process. So you start with some kind of uh, initial evidence of the world, right? Some initial uh, information that you had about this particular stimulus. And then using um, uh, what you have learned in the past, past knowledge or whatever the, 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 the stimulus presented to you, you accumulate information over time until you cross a particular threshold and then a response is generated. Then a decision is made and action is uh, executed. So if we assign that this start level over here is the prior probability uh, something that we already knew about the stimulus, something we already knew about the task. Uh, and the threshold is the confidence level. So as you acquire or you collect uh, and you accumulate uh, information and further evidence uh, about uh, the task and the stimulus, uh, then you will reach a particular point, this threshold, where you say, oh, now I'm confident enough to make a decision, to uh, generate a response. 
And then this uh, linear rising uh, process, uh, it can be um, said that it's equivalent to the rate of evidence accumulation. So sometimes when you make such a, you generate such a response, uh, the uh, uh, rate uh, of rise or the rate of evidence accumulation can be extremely fast. That means that, that uh, the time it takes you to cross the, the, the threshold, uh, it's uh, very small, or it can be very, very long, uh, very, very late, uh, meaning it takes a very long time to generate uh, uh, the response. So if you allow this uh, accumulation process uh, to vary from trial to trial, and you collect every time how much it took you to generate the response, essentially measure the latency, and you plot the distribution, then this uh, uh, non-Gaussian um, uh, skewed to the right uh, latency histogram becomes a universal property of any saccade eye movement. This, if you measure saccade, uh, in, um, in any saccade related uh, task and you plot the latency, then the, the latency of um, the, the saccade latency always has this type of um, uh, uh, shape. Now, this conceptually, it, it is very simple model. Uh, it makes sense, right? Uh, all this uh, start level threshold and rate of rise uh, can be um, uh, correlated with uh, stuff that we already know, like the confidence level or the rate of evidence accumulation. But the question is, although conceptually uh, this might be very attractive, has ever been any evidence in the brain that this is the case? And as a matter of fact, there is. Uh, there are many different accumulator processes in the brain, and they have been reported from many, many studies in various uh, brain regions, such as the posterior parietal cortex, the prefrontal cortex, the premotor cortex, the basic ganglia, the superior colliculus. And what they found from these uh, studies is that the rate of uh, rise or the rate of evidence accumulation, it's, not, it's no longer uh, linear, but instead uh, it's, uh, it follows more like a, a Markovian or a random walk. Uh, so there is, um, it's linear on, on, the, on the average, but there is a lot of noise around this uh, average um, uh, accumulation rate. Now, um, I want to take now, shift a little bit, go to a few other um, ideas, and I want to show you why these race uh, models cannot really work in the anti saccade task. And the reason they cannot work in the anti saccade task is that although they are attractive in terms of uh, having um, to make only a single decision, when you are faced with multiple decisions, um, they cannot really replicate uh, the outcomes or the, the results that are being observed uh, in the lab. So let's make a, a simple assumption that we have two decision signals, decision signal one and decision signal two. There are two different decisions that are, that are going to uh, decide which one uh, you're going to uh, make. They're, they're going to generate different eye movement. And for the sake of uh, simplicity, let's uh, make this each decision signal. It has the same duration and the same um, uh, uh, intensity. And let's say that each decision signal is, uh, is integrated by two different but independent uh, race models. So one race uh, model is this, and the other race model is that. Now, the difference between the two race models is that the linear rise of um, uh, evidence accumulation uh, takes values from uh, a normal distribution uh, with new, uh, with mean uh, mu one and standard deviation sigma one, and if you allow that uh, to um, uh, to cross the threshold uh, t sub h, then an error pro saccade is generated. Now the other race model, which is is completely independent from the previous one, uh, then uh, the difference between uh, the two is that this. Um, uh, linear rise uh, phase takes values from a 
a different normal distribution with a different mean and different standard deviation, uh, but uh, it crosses the same threshold level. Well, if this one crosses the threshold, then a different eye movement is generated, the anti saccade And what we have here is we allow that the, the model that crosses the threshold first is the one that um, makes a decision and therefore a different eye movement is uh, generated each time. So in the case where, uh, let's say, the uh, accumulation of information for uh, the, the, the top race model, it is faster than the, uh, the bottom one, then an error pro saccade is generated. Or if uh, the, uh, the, the, this linear rising phase of the second race model it's faster than the first one, then anti saccade is generated. But if you remember, during the anti saccade task, there was not just those two response types, but there was also uh, um, uh, a response during, uh, in a trial where a subject made a narrow pro saccade followed by an anti saccade. So having two completely independent race models cannot really capture all the behavioral. Uh, uh, characteristics or the behavioral outcomes of the anti saccade task. So you need to include uh, some kind of interaction. And depending on which one is faster and which one is uh, slower, uh, and depending on the strength of this interaction, this type of inhibition, it's potentially possible that an error pro saccade is expressed first, followed by an anti saccade. But it's also possible that an anti saccade is expressed first, followed by an error pro saccade. And this is something, this type of behavior was never been observed. So when I, we were first um, uh, formed a collaboration with a group of, uh, from um, uh, King's College uh, London, um, we wanted to uh, uh, simulate or emulate uh, these properties of um, the, um, the anti-Sakata task. So we generated, coming from a neural network background, we generated the simplest possible uh, uh, neural network. Uh, it was a, a one layer neural network. It had a, a, a bunch of uh, nodes uh, which represented population of neurons. Uh, so in the brain, neurons usually fi fire action potentials or spikes. Uh, here, each node represented a small population of those spiking uh, neurons. Uh, so the, uh, the neuronal activity of each node in the, the model represented the average firing rate uh, of the, uh, the, the number of spikes of all these smaller um, uh, cells, uh, spiking cells generated over time. And then we allowed that uh, the connectivity in this uh, model to be uh, fully competitive. Uh, meaning that each node sent a, a positive signal to itself, so it's self-excited, and then inhibited uh, uh, the, the neighbors. And then uh, since in the anti saccade uh, task we have two uh, decision uh, signals, uh, we made um, the, uh, the decision signals to have the same duration. Uh, we had a reactive decision signal that coded for the error pro saccade, and we had uh, a voluntary decision signal that coded for the anti saccade. Uh, the duration was the same, but uh, the, um, uh, the, there was a delay in um, the integration time by 50 milliseconds. Uh, now, we also made that the uh, intensity of, uh, the, of the strength of the uh, decision signals to be uh, not equal, but instead, uh, we made uh, this voluntary decision signal 1.5 times uh, larger than the reactive one. By making that, we uh, follow very uh, closely the instructions that the participants uh, received. That was, even if you make an error, you should always correct it with, uh, uh, with the anti saccade And then we said that uh, uh, each of those uh, decision signals are integrated in further apart uh, uh, nodes. And then uh, these nodes, uh, this integration of those um, inputs, uh, follow a Gaussian uh, distribution, meaning uh, one receives the maximum of this uh, input, and uh, all the uh, nearest neighbors receive a subset uh, or a subset of the strength of that uh, particular input. 
and then we allow the the the, the circuit it, uh, itself uh, to um, compete with one another. The different nodes compete with one another and uh, record the, the latency. So a little bit about the mathematics behind it. Uh, we use differential equations uh, to describe what is the internal state, what's the uh, the average neural activity of a, of a, a node. Uh, so dx dt is how this internal state of a node changes over time. Uh, this is the leaky term, the interaction term, and a bunch of inputs it receives plus some uh, noise that always exists there. Then the um, take this x. Uh, for every time step, and we find the average firing rate of the node, which is uh, was nothing more than a sigmoidal. And then the interaction matrix, this W, was uh, given by this um, difference of exponentials in such a way that um, this uh, cell uh, excited its nearest neighbors, the, the immediate, but uh, uh, inhibited the, um, the, the nodes in, uh, um, in a further way. All right, so with that introduction in place, I just want to show you some results of uh, a computational uh, model of anti saccar performance uh, in schizophrenia. And the reason I'm showing this is because it's one of the very first um, uh, computational attempts uh, that statistically has shown that a neural model is able to fit almost perfectly experimental data but at the same time, it's able to uncover the potential mechanisms that uh, describe the schizophrenia performance in the anti task. All right. All right. So the task was um, and the data were collected uh, in the early 2000s, uh, 2000 by Uli Ettinger. Uh, he, he was um, at uh, King's College uh, London. Uh, it was published, uh, the study was published uh, years later, uh, that tested the anti saccade performance of 45 schizophrenia suffering patients and 34 healthy controls. Uh, the subjects were not age matched. Uh, the, um, the task was exactly as uh, I, I, I described a few slides back. Uh, a, a subject fixates, then this uh, fixation point disappears. Uh, either to the left or to the right, a peripheral stimulus appears, and the subject needs to make an eye movement in the mirror loca location, but in the opposite di direction uh, of the peripheral stimulus. So if they turn the eyes towards the peripheral stimulus, that was recorded as an error. If they turn the eyes in the opposite direction, uh, in the mirror location, that was uh, uh, recorded as a correct, uh, as an unsaccade or a corrected unsaccade. Now, what they observed is um, that the, um, the mean saccade reaction times uh, for, uh, with respect to the aeropro saccade between the two groups, the healthy controls and the patients, didn't differ so much between one another, statistically speaking. However, the, um, uh, the, uh, the patients or the mean latency for the anti saccade for the patients was a lot bigger or larger, uh, the mean value, compared to the controls, and also highly more variable. And the same was also true for the corrected antisaccar. Now, the key feature of what sets apart healthy controls from schizophrenia patients, it's not so much about the mean latency, but it's actually the error rate. And we can see here that healthy controls do make mistakes, do make errors, do make uh, uh, generate error prosacats. The error rate is roughly around 25%, but now in schizophrenia patients, uh, this almost doubles. And if we follow the, um, uh, the, the top of the variability, we can see that they can make uh, mistakes up to 80% of uh, the times, 80% of the trials. So the question here is, uh, what uh, um, causes schizophrenia su suffering patients to have this type of properties? Why have uh, longer anti or corrected anti but not error pro -saccades? And why have more error rates compared to healthy controls? What is going on in the brain? 
when we are facing with the problem that since this is a psychological study on a human participant, we cannot really insert electrodes and record uh, neuronal activity. So the best way to actually uh, decipher what are, are potentially these mechanisms is by using uh, computational uh, models. Uh, so the model is uh, exactly as I described it uh, before, right? Uh, so we have a one layer neural network. Um, it has uh, a number of those different nodes. Each node uh, represents uh, the population uh, uh, firing rate activity of uh, uh, individual neurons that fire spikes, right? Uh, then they have um, each node uh, self excites uh, itself and uh, inhibits uh, its, uh, uh, its uh, distant neighbors, but excites its, uh, its um, uh, close uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, we have two different inputs, one describing uh, the uh, error pro saccade, the decision signal, and the other one coding for the uh, anti saccade or the voluntary saccade. And we allow those two inputs to be integrated by different nodes in the, the, in the model. And then we allow the model itself uh, to self-organize and produce um, a similar type of activity as uh, is seen um, uh, by human participants. So here we see, for instance, that the interaction matrix uh, between uh, nearest neighbors is uh, excitation. Right, uh, but as the the nodes uh, are further apart, uh, then be, this becomes a long distance inhibition. And here is a, here is a graph of the neuronal dynamics: how the average firing rate of each node changes with respect to time. So we can see that the node twenty, which is the solid curve that um, codes for the error. Um, generates uh, or integrates information extremely fast, crosses the threshold, and then a latency is recorded, a response is recorded. Whereas now for the node that codes for the anti-saccade uh, is 50 millisecond delayed, right? And then it takes a very long time, almost linearly, to integrate the information before it crosses the threshold and the response is also generated. So the uh, mechanism now in this model that um, uh, can uh, uh, generate a variability in the latency in the in the response is was uh, this uh, tau um, uh, parameter, which uh, if we take it on the other side will be uh, one over tau and then all these uh, terms, and then we allow this one over tau. Uh, for um, the two nodes that code for the different uh, inputs uh, to take uh, values from different uh, normal distributions. Uh, each normal di distribution had a different mean and uh, standard deviation. And now if we allow the model, we allow to uh, run the model for, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, 10,000 times or 30,000 or 50,000 times, each time recording uh, the response, you know, how much time it took for uh, the neural activity to cross the threshold, um, then what will end up, which I'll show you in the next slides, it is that we found that um, in terms of the parameter values to generate the results that follow, is that the threshold level between the healthy controls, which are outside the parentheses, and the uh, schizophrenia patients, which are inside the parentheses, the threshold level or the confidence level was it's exactly the same. As if the schizophrenia, the disease, has not really made those uh, participants less confident about the decisions. However, what changes is how fast or how slow they accumulate information and whether the accumulation rate is more noisy, more variable than um, in the schizophrenia uh, condition inside the parenthesis, as opposed to the control condition outside the parenthesis. So we can see that there is uh, variability, uh, longer variability in terms of the standard deviation for both um, uh, um, uh, uh, nodes coding for the different uh, uh, signals. Um, and also for new. 
Now, uh, when we uh, allow the model to run uh, for many, many trials, then we compare and contrasted the um, uh, mean tendencies of the uh, experimental uh, uh, participants as opposed to the simulated ones. And we found statistically uh, different differences between the anti-saccade, the mean anti-saccade reaction time and the corrected anti-saccade reaction time for the uh, patients as opposed to controls, much like it was observed uh, uh, from the experimental data, but no difference for the error pro saccade. And similarly type of uh, differences in the error rate, uh, the simulated patients produce a lot more errors than uh, uh, healthy controls. In, not in absolute numbers, but actually in terms of the, uh, the trends. All right, so that gave us an indication that the model itself, um, it was in the correct uh, direction. Uh, we wanted to uh, see whether we could do something more about the variability and uh, whether the model itself, it's able to also capture uh, the variability of uh, the data. So all this stuff is just the mean behavior. Let's now go to the, the whether the, the model can capture the variability of uh, the experimental data. So what we did is we, for both the controls and patients, for both the experimental data and the uh, simulated data, we generated something called a cumulative uh, percent distribution with respect to RT. So we end up with uh, this S-shape uh, curves uh, for the error pro saccades, the anti saccades, and the corrected anti saccades. And uh, from statistics, we know that if you take uh, uh, each of those points, you invert it, and you stick a minus sign to that, then those H S-shaped uh, cumulative um, uh, distribution uh, curves, they become linear. So every point here in those uh, three graphs, uh, whether it's a solid line or it's a square line, uh, it's actually the experimental data. And the solid lines that fit those uh, uh, experimental data, it's actually the simulated uh, results. And we found that when we estimated the correlation coefficient, how good the fit was, we found fits of the order of R uh, 0.95 all the way to 0.98, depending on which um, uh, behavior uh, uh, the, uh, we were trying uh, to model. So uh, the model predicted um, that schizophrenia brains are more noisy than healthy brains. And this noise it, it is not on the threshold level, but more on the accumulation rate level. Uh, uh, schizophrenia patients were as confident as healthy controls, meaning that uh, the, uh, the disease itself didn't really affect the uh, areas of the brain that, are, um, uh, that uh, can generate this confidence level. And then we found that um, against the current dogma about the schizophrenia, which says that um, patients that suffer from schizophrenia, uh, they have some kind of impairment in the, the frontal lobe, in the, in the parts of the brain that are, uh, are coordinating or making the correct decisions for them, um, uh, and generating inhibitory or impulse uh, control uh, signals we found that we don't need this third inhibitory signal from the frontal lobes, at least for the data that we have. But instead, what we want is a, a competition between two decision signals, which are integrated in the same uh, layer of, uh, uh, of the same neural network. Now, since then, uh, we have done a lot of other work. Um, so I've uh, uh, collaborated with a number of different labs. Uh, as I said, I'm a computational neuroscientist, but a model itself without data can be, uh, it has no meaning. Uh, so usually I collaborate with a lot of, uh, uh, with different um, experimental groups, which provide with the data, then I generate the models and trying to see whether the model can generate similar type of response as the data. So I've uh, modeled the obsessive compulsive disorder and the, uh, how those uh, patients um, 
behave in the anti saka task that was published in 2017. Recently, we had uh, uh, via collaboration with uh, Cardiff University, we modeled the anti saka performance in Huntington disease. And there we showed that um, Huntington uh, 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 patients, uh, particularly the ones that they haven't uh, really manifested uh, the, uh, the symptoms of the disease, uh, the, uh, the, the, the notion of competition between two decision signals as opposed to have a third one to inhibit the, uh, the errors, it's still valid in the, in the early Huntington disease. And it was recently published um, a couple of months ago. And now we have, uh, I have ongoing uh, uh, collaborations uh, with uh, uh, people from Lancaster uh, modeling Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and uh, how age might affect uh, healthy controls uh, over time, obviously. And this is a collaboration with uh, Liverpool and um, some guy from, uh, from Canada. So if, uh, without further ado, I would like to thank, obviously, uh, uh, all my collaborators that provide me with the data. Uh, and some of these uh, studies were uh, funded by different um, uh, funding agencies. Uh, and um, well, thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer them. Right. Uh, well, it seems that uh, you don't have any uh, questions. So if you enjoyed the, uh, the talk or uh, when you view the talk and uh, there's something that wasn't clear enough when I, I spoke, please uh, send me an email and uh, look for me on the, um, the website of the School of Computer Science. And I'm more happy to answer any of, uh, of uh, these uh, questions. Thank you very much.